of Human Services, and we drove down here together from Burlington today. So now it's normal to have a lot of women in the administration, at least in Vermont. Um, and I just gave them the chance. You know, they, they each did excellent work, and uh, their resumes may have been slightly different from the men who had held those positions. But I think I looked at the resumes differently. I saw the potential. Um, often when, when people are appointed or hired, uh, the criteria is like the person who held the job before. Mm -hmm. And for example, women may not have built up a resume because they spent 10 years raising children but, and doing volunteer work. Well, those experiences might be very useful if you hold a job in any job to have a sense of the community and, and have other talents. So that was exciting. Uh, and I, I would say each one of the women I appointed have succeeded. And, and when Dick Snelling followed me, uh, he kept most of those uh, positions, and other governors have since felt sort of a silent pressure to not go backwards anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. sign any books that you might wish. Thank you. You've been a great audience. <laughs> and I hope you do because it's a phenomenal book. And speaking on a very personal note, I just turned 80. So I really appreciate what she's been saying. <laughs> it, it's it's funny, you know. Um, it's it, there's something about that magic number eight that makes you rethink about everything. And my rethinking isn't anywhere near as elegant as <laughs> Madeline Cunin's, but it, it it's an important milestone. So appreciate very much her her discussion about not only the book but the feelings that go into the book. But at Happy this point, well, <laughs> it was a little while ago. But um, I would like you all to um, multitask because we are limited in time. And I want to introduce Rich Fiesta, Rich is the executive director of the Alliance for Retired Americans. And I haven't really talked about the Alliance for Retired Americans. And I really need to, simply because that's the primary reason we're here. We want to make a difference. And we want to make that difference for seniors. And as Madeline said, we are one of the, well, not one of, we are the biggest voting bloc in the United States and in Vermont in particular, which is a, known as an aging state. And we have needs. And a lot of those needs are not being addressed very well. And we feel that we need to have the power, and that's what this conference is all about, fueling senior power. Um, and that applies to both Congress as well as the state legislature. So with that, let me talk about Rich for a minute. <laughs> Why don't we, what? 
people get through because there's just going to be too much noise. You think so? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Well, minutes. Rich is willing to give a little bit of his time, but um, <laughs> lots of it. <laughs> lots of his time. But he he's come all the way from Washington to talk to us, so I want to make sure he gets a chance. Sure. Um, but I do want to say that. He became executive director in, I wrote it down. 2013. 2013, mm. yes. And um, we are growing. There are, we've just established new chapters in several states across the nation. And we are totally Well, I hate to say this, but kind of middle class people. We are not the wealthy. We somehow are not very middle class sometimes. <laughs> and um, this is a, a organization that really seeks to support the people who need government assistance and need government reassurance because they're still trying to attack Social Security after all of these years. And that is most of our lifeline. All right. So, okay, I'll, I'll get off by... I wanted to let you know that the, Alli the Vermont Alliance for Retired Americans has a small collection of books on labor in honor of our first president, Chet Briggs, and it's at the Aldridge Library in Barrie, and Karen uh, has brought the books, some of the books, so that you can see what's available there. Chet was our inspiration for getting the ARA started originally, and this is, I think I told you, the 15th anniversary of our, uh, our founding. So take a look. We'll add to the collection as things go along, and um, it's a great resource, and it can be obtained if you're really interested in labor books um, through interlibrary loan if you don't live in the Barry Montpelier area. So, and now, let's hear from Richard. Actually works, thanks. <laughs> Uh, and great to be back again. I think we were really honored to have the governor here and uh, just the great service she gave to the state of Vermont. And then after dealing with that, and Vermont is a big diverse state, and then how would you like to be appointed ambassador to a country that has four official languages, uh, <laughs> which is what she then had to go through. And the Principality of Liechtenstein, I read, uh, as well. Uh, but it was just, I mean, for me, just a great honor, and I know in Vermont, everybody knows everybody. You know, you see Bernie at the grocery store, and, you know, and, and things, you know, things like that. Uh, and I do like coming up uh, when we can uh, as well. Um, it's great to get to hear Bernie with that crisp New England accent uh, that he has. And, uh, always, always enjoy that uh, as well. Just for like, remember Orson Bean back in the uh, the game show guy from Vermont back in the '60s, and Bernie just kind of like. Anyway, what I want to talk about today is uh, what's up. There are important national legislative bills uh, that Congress is going to consider so soon on prescription drugs, a lot of seniors issues uh, coming along. So uh, just talk about that because between now and the end of the year, um, both federal and um, I know a number of other issues um, are going to be coming up. Uh, so Jane said, as you know, the Alliance was founded by the AFL-CIO back in 2001 to be a, and thank you again, Governor. Uh, to be, uh, you know, an active force for retirees and retiree programs, not only on retiree issues, but other things that we uh, care and lobby about, like minimum wage, the right to bargain collectively, uh, for example, as well. well. We now have about four and a half million chapters, a number of, in the labor movement, a number of unions care about their retirees and organize their retirees that then fold in 
to us, Bruce, who came from the machinists. They have an active retiree uh, program around the country. A number of others do. Um, auto workers, steel workers, machinists, teachers, postal workers. Uh, quite a number have uh, their own uh, as well. And state workers, too. Yes, uh, state uh, workers. And in a lot of states, like here, I was just in Kentucky a few weeks ago, that if the state workers are an independent union, they are here, Kentucky, and quite a number of states, actually, but they still join us and uh, are our backbone on a lot of issues uh, uh, around the country. Vermont's a, a great example of that. Our president is uh, Robert Roach, who for many years was the Secretary, international secretary treasurer of the machinists. He came out of the transportation industry, airlines. So for a number of years, remember all those bankruptcies in the airline industry in the 90s and 2000s? So he has become quite an expert in pension and retirement issues because of his work there. And our secretary treasurer is Joe Peters, who came from the auto workers. Again, uh, an industry that had a lot of retiree issues on health care, uh, pensions, and the like as well. I'd like this to be a map of the Electoral College next year, <laughs> <laughs> one in here for good, of all these blue states. But it's actually where we have uh, chapters. As, uh, we just started a Kentucky chapter uh, this year. Next Saturday, unfortunately, I uh, can't be back in Vermont. I'm going to be in Topeka, Kansas, and we're going to start the Kansas Alliance for Retired Americans chapter. So. <laughs> No maple syrup, there are no trees to turn colors, uh, it's flat, and they don't have craft beer. Uh, barbecue! But they barbe got barbecue. barbecue, so that's right, Kansas City barbecue. That, I'll have to bring a Vermont beer with me uh, as well. So we're growing uh, there. You know, obviously, some states weren't as union dense as they call it as others, but we're kind of infilling uh, as we go along uh, as well. Uh, and you know, we, we are advocates. Uh, we keep score. We have an annual congressional voting record where we keep 10 U.S. House and 10 Senate votes every year. It's easy coming here because everybody gets 100 uh, for Vermont, all, all three of you know, your members. It's easy in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Other states, not so much, uh, but it's a good thing. Uh, members of Congress use it in um, uh, they're tweeting and their websites, they'll use it in their campaigns. We have a newsletter anybody can sign up for called the Friday Alert by email. How many here kind of get it or do get it? Good. Uh, I know Bruce, we're trying to get you back on uh, to it uh, as well, but it's a good what's up not only in Washington, but also what's up going around in our states uh, as well, because a lot of senior advocacy issues happen in state capitals, Meals on Wheels, the senior centers, uh, Medicaid, for example. It's just as important to be active in the state as with uh, the federal level. Uh, Spanish language, most of our fact sheets uh, are in Spanish on the website. We do have a website uh, as well. We do, uh, as bills come up, if you're uh, we'll ask you to you know, send a pass-through letter to your member of Congress, uh, for example, to uh, vote for or sometimes against a uh, piece of legislation. So you know, that's our activism as well. And just here's some general photos of us uh, uh, around both D.C. and around the country. We like to take good pictures uh, mm -hmm. of um, seniors. Uh, we're ex for expanding Social Security. This is a press conference. He was right off camera and had to leave, but Senator Sanders was there. He has a bill to expand Social Security, uh, for example. Um, our Connecticut president next door, Betty Marafino on the left, came down, testified on Social Security, because her congressman's now, because elections matter, the chairman of the Social Security uh, subcommittee. And if we don't like certain members of Congress, this guy Tillis from South Carolina, uh, although it says Phyllis, I will change that back. The, the, the TH is, my editing's not so good. So sometimes we'll tell folks, you know, you're not on our side. Uh, and we do hero and zero um, off of our voting record. Um, there's um, uh, our Florida people. There's a congresswoman from Florida named Frederica Wilson. Uh, um, she was a state senator. She has a very important subcommittee now since the Democrats uh, took the House back. She has the jurisdiction over most federal labor laws, the National Labor Relations Act. But she's known for wearing hats. Uh, so somehow our Florida people got a baker to bake a cake like one of her hats. So that pink, 
object is actually a cake. Uh, and there she is in one of her hats. Uh, so as you know, every year we celebrate the anniversary of Medicare on July 30, the anniversary of Social Security on June, or excuse me, August 14th. They're two weeks apart, so we'll do cakes. You go visit your office of your local congressman or senator, or we'll go to the Social Security Administration and say thank you, because the frontline members there. Yes, Jane. And August 14th is my birthday. Oh, is that right? Oh. Well, you're younger than Social Security, because uh, 2020 will be the 85th anniversary of Social Security and the 55th anniversary of Medicare. And it's an election year, so we're going to plan and do a lot there. So good to know. August 14th is going to be easy to remember now. Uh, <laughs> in Vermont as well. And then we help the people who are part of us, um, union. Uh, we are the labor movements organization. We just had a number of retirees around the country out on UAW picket lines, for example. And uh, we had San Francisco retired teachers going up to Stockton, California to work a picket line, uh, for example. Uh, last year, it didn't get a lot of national publicity, but the state of Missouri voted down by statewide referendum right to work by a two to one margin. Yeah. Uh, and we were very active uh, in that uh, as well. That was a year ago uh, in August. So you know, we're out there, we're being active, having meetings, uh, not only as the Alliance, but with our participating groups uh, as well. So what I want to talk a little more about for the rest of my time here is on just our issues on retirement. Um, no question, Americans, regardless of party, think the U.S. is in a retirement crisis, uh, that there's not enough money uh, for people to have a decent quality of life in retirement. Um, and the recent polling this year by um, a group, National Institute for Retirement Security, that does very good work, especially uh, in the public sector and public sector retirements as well as private, um, did a poll. And it doesn't matter. People do believe that there is a retirement uh, crisis here. Four out of five households have less than one year's income saved. Uh, and if you, and half of people in the pre retiree years, 45 to 54, have nothing saved uh, as well. And if you're 55 to 65, getting closer to retirement and Social Security and Medicare, again, very little saved because real wages in this country for working people, you know, adjusted for inflation, have not gone up mm -hmm. since the 1980s. They've been flat, but health care has gone up the highest inflation part of our economy. You know, cost of living out of everything else has gone up, but wages have not gone up. So all this productivity, think back to 1980, where there were no computers and no, no web and all of this, all the gains from that productivity have gone to the very, very top in our society uh, because we have a tax system and other structures in our economy that have rewarded that, but the, the folks who are out working have not gotten a better deal. And also, economists say, it's also due to the decline of people who are in a labor union or who have collective bargaining in their workplace to bargain for better wages and benefits and retirement as well. And we're seeing it with what's happening now in the economy. Social Security, because fewer people have pensions, fewer people have savings, becomes even more important in retirement. Uh, and where it may have been about half of your retirement income, now 75% of people rely on it for the majority of their income. And in the bottom 25% of people who are making under 10,000 or under 20,000, it's that red part of the graph. Social Security is a huge part of your retirement income. And our Social Security uh, system is good, but it's not going to sustain you. Uh, Vermont is above average. About one out of four people receive Social Security either through retirement or you lost a spouse or a parent or you're disabled. That's higher than the national average by about 5%. Uh, the typical Vermont retiree is just getting under $15,000 a year in Social Security. 
anyone here can live just on fifteen thousand dollars a year? Of course not. Uh, and that's why we we'll talk about why we need to expand it. Um, as you probably saw, about two three weeks ago, the cola for next year came out, uh, one point six percent, and of course that keeps right up with healthcare inflation, right? <laughs> Drugs are only going, insulin's only gone up 1.6%, right? Uh, or any kind of healthcare uh, as well. So uh, we're gonna talk in a second about how we need to uh, expand Social Security, but Social Security in Vermont is bringing in almost 7% of the state's income uh, through the year. $2.2 .2 billion come into Vermont every year and as we know, that money gets spent. That's not stuffed in the mattress or given to a hedge fund or something like that. That it is a very important part of the economy and that's what we keep trying to tell members of Congress and the like who want to privatize it or cut benefits. Uh, we can't afford it, we hear that a lot. Uh, it is very important and especially when we had the economic downturn. Social Security was coming in every month uh, and was sort of a counterweight when the economy uh, goes down as well. Uh, in Medicare in Vermont, uh, just under 150,000 Vermonters are on it, and there's not, it looks like, a, a lot of Medicare Advantage plan uptake in Wisconsin, that 90% of the population uh, is just on regular traditional Part A, Part B, uh, fee-for-service, see your own doctor as well, which means then if you want the drug you have to go get the Part D program uh, as well. I mean, it just shows the way the insurance industry uh, has worked since these private insurance plans have come into Medicare. They don't care about small states. Uh, you know, they want New York or California where they can have lots of people in plans as well. And there are issues in the Medicare Advantage plans on coverage uh, and the like there, especially in a nursing home because uh, it's just dealing with a friend who uh, his father was in, in Florida and they had a Medicare Advantage plan and could not find a skilled nursing facility, a nursing home to take him uh, because the reimbursement rate under that Medicare Advantage plan was too low. And so he's trying to wait so it's open season to get him back into regular Medicare uh, as well. So you have to be very, very careful uh, on choosing Medicare versus Medicare Advantage every year as well. Vermont. Uh, in the Affordable Care Act, there are very important 74,000 people pre-Medicare have at least one or more pre-existing conditions and had the ACA been repealed, remember it was Senator McCain and the one thumbs down mm -hmm. that kept it alive, um, pre-existing conditions would not have been covered uh, anymore and that really hurts people who are pre-Medicare, over 50 but not yet ready at 65 for it as well. Uh, that's something we have to watch uh, as well. So that's kind of what Medicare and Social Security bring in Vermont. And uh, I want to talk uh, at the end here about what's up legislatively and on the map over the next coming months as well. It starts with drug care uh, and drug prices as, uh, as well. You know. Americans pay the highest prescription drug prices in the world, and that hasn't happened by accident. You know, we, we don't negotiate uh, for our programs like our competitors do in Europe and uh, right here in Canada. Has anyone here either gone to Canada or knows someone who's gone to Canada to buy a prescription drug? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just a few miles away, right? Bus, took buses. We took bus, buses. Exactly. We took early in our years at the Alliance, we, yeah. we did that from Maine to Washington State. We uh, sent people into Canada, came back, had a press conference. Senator Sanders is very important. Now, Senator Br work. Brown uh, from Ohio, when he was a congressman, was very helpful uh, with us as well. We had people, and it hasn't changed, you know, and that's 15, plus uh, years ago. I mean, in Canada, you can walk into a pharmacy and buy insulin over the counter for what, 10 to 20% of the cost in the US, uh, for example, uh, and other things. There, there was a, another drug that's used in breast cancer called tamoxifen, and because the brand name company can cut these side deals with the generics to keep it off market or at a higher price, it's 90% cheaper in Canada. 
uh, for example, than it is in the, in the United States. Uh, just, just criminal. Uh, yeah, exa and it's affecting not only personally, but all of our public programs, like Medicaid, Medicare, the CHIP insurance programs uh, as well. And all of us as taxpayers, some way or the other, are feeling that. If you're negotiating with the state government on your VSEA plans, for example, or in the private sector, it, we all feel it some way uh, or the other. So in the last 12 months, uh, ARP did some polling this past year. And this is seniors, 44% delayed filling a prescription. That's almost half because they couldn't afford it. A quarter didn't fill it at all. I mean, you just hear stories from pharmacists saying, you know, pushing the bag back, you can't afford it. Or even as bad, taking less medication that prescribed, and that is very bad and can be have bad health consequences as well. So these are real, real everyday issues uh, that we're seeing. They found that um, about 20, almost one in five Vermonters on this poll, not stop taking a drug because of cost, uh, for example. So what we're hoping to get done by the end of the year, and this is where elections have consequences, mm -hmm. is HR3. Uh, in the House of Representatives, it's passed out of all the appropriate committees, and Speaker Pelosi's office said this last week it will be on the House floor after the Thanksgiving recess in December. So we'll get revved up, we'll do emails asking you, again, it's easy here to tell Peter Welsh to go vote for HR3, because I think he's a co-sponsor already, but they like, politicians like to hear, they like to be comforted, so it's, you know, free just to push the button, send a letter, and he'll probably send you a letter back by email uh, as well. Uh, but this is the first time that we have the ability, since, Part D was passed that said, thou shalt not negotiate to HHS in 2003 to start allowing Medicare to negotiate, and HR3 also will apply it to the private sector as well, to private sector drugs uh, that people in private health care plans get as well, which would be state plans or uh, private pl uh, just private industry plans. Uh, as well there, because if they don't, then there's a very high excise tax uh, put on the companies as well for their drugs. So they're going to start with the 250 highest drugs. I mean, the HHS has never done this before, so they have to gear up, and frankly, at least for the next year, we have folks at HHS who are not on our side um, on a lot of this, too. The person who runs Medicare and Medicaid ran those programs in Indiana for then Governor Pence. Uh, and she is no friend uh, of anything that we've been for. And there have been lawsuits uh, trying to stop changes in regulations and the like there. Good news, too, is HR3 will cap anybody's drug prices at $2,000 uh, a year. If you're on Part D and you go into the donut hole, you're paying a lot, you've already spent well over $2,500, and if you come out of the donut hole, you're still paying 5% on the catastrophic. So if you're on Medicare, this is a maximum cost reduction uh, to you as well. There's a Senate bill that uh, Senator Grassley from Iowa is on. Not as good as this, because you will probably be seeing now because the president's tweeting the Grassley bill is better and these people don't know what they're doing in the House. No negotiation, and the cap in the Senate bill is $3,100. Uh, it's 33% higher. So HR3, uh, better for all of us, and at least we'll get it out of the House this year. So that's one thing we're going to be working on uh, over the next six weeks, hopefully next month. Um, expanding Social Security. Uh, we've been talking about it for years. Uh, we've changed the debate. Groups like the Alliance and other Social Security advocates, because even in the Obama administration, the so-called smart people were saying, you know, we have to cut Social Security in order to save it and mm -hmm. change the COLA to even a lower COLA than we have now. The conversations uh, changed. Um, there's one bill in by Congresswoman Linda Sanchez from California. We like it the best. Um, it 
raises the payroll cap, which this year is 132,000, without taxing and raising the FICA on working people. We just take the cap over 10 years and eliminate it. And then we have more money coming into the trust funds. We have a better CPI that's based on what seniors and the elderly spend their money on, which starts with health care, the highest part of inflation in our economy. Uh, surviving spouses, widows, widowers will get a higher benefit as well. And then the minimum benefit for people who had lower incomes in their working life, there's a guaranteed minimum. That will go up uh, as well. So we're talking about it. Um, I don't think they're going to do anything on it this year, because um, I'm going to talk about the WEP bill in a second. Uh, but we can, there is momentum at some point for expanding Social Security. Trade and NAFTA, this is another thing we could be facing uh, in the coming months. Um, the new negotiated NAFTA, or it's called USMCA, we just call it NAFTA 2.0, between Canada, the US, and Mexico, actually locks in more monopoly protections for the drug industry. Surprise. Um, especially in the new type of drugs called biologic, biologically based. They are not very much of the drug market, less than 5%, but they're the largest cost. Uh, and they're evolving and coming on the market every year. So our patent law will be extended in all three countries, or the three other, two other countries would be as well. So it gives the manufacturers more monopoly, uh, <coughs> less time for generics uh, as well. So the drug industry got, I mean, it looks like Trump is copying off the Mexican yeah, pres <laughs> president. Yeah. There's like, how do you spell my name? Uh, and, and Trudeau is looking like, I want to get out of here. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's something we have to watch. Uh, we understand uh, there, there are people because of agriculture and other things that want to get this on the floor, but Speaker Pelosi says it's not happening till this gets fixed and quite a number of labor protections and environmental protections need to be changed too. But that's something we're watching just like <coughs> HR3. Um, this doesn't apply so much to Vermont, but it applies to most every other New England state that a number of state and local governments have never been in the social security system. You know, when it was founded uh, and created, states had the option, uh, not the private sector, but states had the option of whether or not to participate in social security. And a number did not and still do not today. So they have their own separate state-based uh, pension systems outside of social security. Well, a gift from the Reagan administration in the 80s said that if you have a state-based pension outside of Social Security and you had enough credits uh, that you worked in the private sector, that you got Social Security credits, they look at what your Social Security would be and your state pension, and then through a formula, they cut your Social Security benefits, even though you worked in the private sector and got them. And sometimes it can be a very dramatic up to a third of what your Social Security benefit would have been. Uh, and it's very important in Massachusetts and Connecticut and Rhode Island and Maine, uh, for example. Um, so the new chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, which oversees Social Security and Medicare and uh, trade, for example, is Richard Neal from Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, and he's now the chair, so he can decide, I want to fix the WEP. Uh, so he just in October put in a bill that would, if you're retired and you're a victim of what's called the windfall elimination uh, provision, after the bill passage, you will get another $150 a month, $1,800 a year, just added on to your Social Security benefit to make up. Uh, for some people, it's not enough that they're losing, and there's some cases that are people losing uh, between $2,500 and $3,000 a month uh, between a husband and wife on it as well. Then he changes the formula on this thing to bring it uh, down so it is not as harsh uh, as it is now. It's not a complete <coughs> repeal and it gets very technical, but he definitely wants to get this bill out of his committee and onto the House floor at least by the end of the year. And um, there are 20, about 2,400 people in Vermont that are affected by that. My guess is they work somewhere else 
and then uh, retired here in Vermont because if you're right, Vermont state employers or a state employee, you're paying in the Social Security, right? The VSEA people, for example. Um, but other states, in Illinois, for example, the state employees are not covered by Social Security, but the city of Chicago is. Uh, so it, it's same thing in California. It's a real hodgepodge all around the country. And there are somewhere about 5 million plus people who are now retired affected uh, by this as well. So it's a technical issue. Uh, it's obviously unfair, so hopefully we can get that fixed uh, on its way uh, as well. Another thing, uh, private pensions, uh, what are called multi-employer pensions. Um, if you're in the construction industry or a lot of transportation industry, you don't have a pension like if you work for the Ford Motor Company, you, you get the Ford pension. If you, let's say, were an electrical worker in the construction industry, because if you're an electrical worker, you work six months for this company and maybe a year for that company. So all the employers in that industry fund a common pension. That's why it's called multi-employer. And a lot of them, because unionization is down, uh, are in some trouble. Uh, in terms of being able to meet their future needs as well. So there, some have collapsed. Uh, there's the very large one, uh, was the Central States, one of the Teamsters Union, since the trucking industry has mostly gone non-union over the last uh, 30 years or so. So there's a plan to allow a loan program to help these struggling funds uh, as well. There's a separate one for the United Mine Workers, that may run on a, uh, another track uh, as well. But it's, again, a technical issue, but affects a lot of our members uh, nationwide. So hopefully we may see some um, action on that. And I just mentioned the mine workers. I don't think there were a lot of coal mines in Vermont, but there are retired mine workers in every state, uh, believe it or not. And hopefully we'll see some action on that in the coming months uh, as well. The Butch Lewis Act is the uh, multi-employer uh, it's out of the House, and again, it's in that graveyard of the Senate uh, right now, but hopefully we can get some uh, action on it as well. So in closing, two things we think uh, coming up we have to be watchful about. H.R. 3, prescription drugs, uh, and we'll probably be very active over the next month or six weeks. And then unclear is the NAFTA USMCA which has some bad prescription drug uh, monopoly provisions short term. Looking towards next year, you know, election year, get out the vote uh, as well will be very important uh, to us as well. So uh, I'd say just sign up for our Friday alert uh, as well. We also are on Facebook. How many people on Facebook here? Yeah. Seniors are the fastest growing group on Facebook. Because uh, the kids are using stuff, you know, <laughs> TikTok. TikTok, Snap, this, that, whatever, uh, Insta, whatever. Uh, but seniors to communicate with children and grandchildren are very active on Facebook, uh, which also means, as we've seen over the last three years, you can be manipulated on mm -hmm. Facebook. And that nice sounding group really started in St. Petersburg, Russia. And, you know, not in Rutland, Vermont, or someplace like that as well. So we are active on, on Facebook uh, as well. So again, great being here, uh, and looking forward to the uh, rest of the day. Thanks. Great, great idea. Uh, the other thing is, like back in the day, I was in Virginia, and I helped organize a group called Labor Free Whole Rights Now that 
got Equal Rights Amendment forced out of committee for the first time, and it failed by one vote because Chuck Robb, the LJ's son-in-law, didn't pass, didn't vote, so it failed for one vote. Now Virginia's talking about getting the ERA passed again. Mm -hmm. But I think we should couple with people that are trying to get the ERA passed because this, this is a like minimum wage, this is increasing family incomes. When right. you look around the room, you can see women survive longer than men. So I think we should find out where ERA still is not passed and partner with whoever's trying to get it through the state legislature. Good idea. That's a great idea. A good idea. Yeah, uh, there have already been articles since the Virginia legislature flipped on Tuesday that this may be one of the first things they take up in January. Then there's some constitutional legal issues because when ERA was first passed, they said you had to get the 38 states by 1982. So who knows? But having that first, let's get the 38 state to do it, and that looks like that could happen very early next year, and then. You can see what ha happens on fixing it down the road, too. That would be a great thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Could you, I didn't hear that. Excuse me. Sure. Could you, why don't you somebody summarize that in just a couple of sentences? What, what's that? Oh, oh, he was saying um, the Equal Rights Amendment, which came one state short <laughs> of uh, passage back in the 70s and 80s. Now, with the Virginia legislature flipping to Democratic, uh, there's a likelihood it may pass it and then become the 38th state. Because I think Illinois was one that did it that hadn't done it, and now we need one more. Uh, so that could happen, and there have been articles already written in the media about it may be something that the Virginia le new Virginia legislature takes up early next year. Uh, and then I mentioned um, this article also said the original ERA said it had to be ratified within seven years, which would have been 1982, uh, and then did it turn into a pumpkin or not? So there may be some court issues about it, but the important thing is let's get the 38th state to pass it and then go from there. And that probably will happen sometime next year, earlier rather than later. <coughs> Yes, our um, conventions, which is our highest governing body, have passed uh, Medicare for all resolutions or everybody being covered uh, some way or the other. So um, there's, but as we're finding out, what does Medicare for all mean? Because um, we're also seeing that a lot of seniors, when they see the phrase Medicare for all, get very nervous because they think they're gonna lose something. Now, we're kind of informed here, but that's, that's a political problem. But, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, I guess the new phrase is Medicare for all who want it um, could work too. I mean, Obamacare was more about coverage and because of the Supreme Court and, on Medicaid and now this administration cutting it back, uh, we really didn't get the promise of coverage, because so now we have still coverage issues and cost issues on top of it. So we need a new president to fix this. <laughs> <laughs> new Senate. <laughs> and a new Senate, yes. Yeah. New yes. Senate. Yes. So. Okay. Wow. Thank you, Jane. That's always been great. Yeah. Basically, what we wanted to do in this part of the program is that Rich would talk to the national issues, which he certainly did and very, very well, and that we would have local folks talk about what's happening here in Vermont that affects seniors. And the people who are going to be on this panel are very, very deeply involved with seniors. Representative Dan Noyce from Lamoille County and works with, um, wait a minute, <laughs> the, um, he's a, ah, here we go. He's on the Committee on Human Services in the legislature. 
He also works for a living with the Office of Aging out of Barry, and he's the RSVP director for this area. So Dan knows about what's going on. And then going um, geographically, Rita Copeland is the director of the Twin Valley Senior Center, which is in East Montpelier, but it covers Plainfield, Marshfield, all over the place. Cabot, Cabot yeah. Yes. Um, and Rita's been director for how long? Long time. About Twelve years. Twelve years, okay. And from going further north now, we have two wonderful people from Burlington. One is, because I'm looking at her, Cindy ah. Zook. <laughs> Cindy has a very interesting background in that, in addition to working with seniors, <coughs> she has a major background in the theater. Yeah. So I expect a great presentation from you. <laughs> no pressure, though. No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> and yes, she is in the Cathedral Square in Burlington. Yep. But um, and then Gail, Gail, I think I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Moreau? Moreau. Moreau, okay. Or any other way you want. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, she has been the director for the Heidelberg Senior Center in Burlington for a long time, but now her primary um, uh, activity is that she is the, um, where no, is I it? I actually don't think that was right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tell them, Gail. You're the, the, Tell them what you do, Gail. Okay. Okay. Coordinator of Senior Centers of Vermont, yeah. which is a local group in Vermont trying to get coordinated. But I'll let you guys talk about yeah. it, yeah. being very sweet. <laughs> Feel free to stand up for a second. The seats are yeah. hard if everyone wants to stretch. Yeah. I'm glad Dan and I are on the table. Let me see. Thank you. Thank you. What I uh, ask the women to be, present to us is what are the needs of Vermonters? And since they work closely with Vermonters at, at, at both in the city and in the country, I ask them to give us one good reason why we should really support the senior centers, support seniors, and then talk with our legislators. So this is a group of Dan Senior Women. Oh, sorry. It's really hard to hear in here. Yeah, I wondered if you could either turn okay, up the, turn in the mic. Turn up the PA or please I'll take talk. a minute to pass the microphone. No, I talk don't. into it because it's really valuable information to get, but right. if you don't get it. So before we start we do we, we have legislature legislators here. And one is on our board, but we need to hear from them. So Rita, can you hear me up there? Yeah. I don't like it, but <laughs> Okay. I want to thank you for inviting me here today. I am um, Executive Director of Twin Valley Senior Center in East Montpelier, Vermont. I have been the director for about 12 years. The, when I took over as director, the center used to be at what they call the old schoolhouse in Marshfield, Vermont. And they were meeting three times a week, having a meal with seniors that went there, which was probably between six and 12 seniors. And then they were outsourcing to do Meals on Wheels and paying $6 a meal to have the meals brought in by the bus driver when he brought people in and distributed by volunteer drivers. So after I became director, I said, why are we paying this money out when you're cooking here already? So to make a long story short, a couple of the volunteers who had been there a long time agreed with me. And so we took and started <coughs> getting our own meals, cooking them from scratch right there, and um, processing them for the volunteer drivers to take them out. Today, the center runs the 
we do about a thousand meals a week or more. And we also um, feed the seniors at the center three days a week. We have to do a lot of fundraising. We're a nonprofit. And that's very difficult to do a lot of times when you don't have enough help to do it. The center mostly runs on volunteers. We only pay staff or myself and a cook. The rest of it is all done by volunteers. <coughs> Wonderful, dedicated people. We cover six towns. We cover Cabot, Marshfield, Woodbury, East Montpelier, Plainfield, and um, Cabot if I didn't say that. So we're in a very, very rural area. I haven't had an opportunity, because I'm the only one working on the administrative part, to get out into the communities to do outreach. What little bit I have done, I know that seniors are very stubborn and set in their ways, <coughs> like me. I sometimes succeed in getting them to come and try just once come have a meal and socialize and play bingo or go to the exercise classes. But there again, I have just learned a couple of months ago that my transportation, I have to cut it by three hours. We have a bus through Council on Aging contract that pays for transportation to different areas. And I know they have a lot to cover because I think there was 18 senior centers if I'm correct. And they also do local transportation in the city like Project Independence and things like that. I understand fully that they have to cut the time so that it can all be shared. The problem is I think it stems down from the government funding for transportation for these areas. It needs to be increased if they don't have enough to go around. Because I think it's vitally important to furnish the transportation, to bring these people out in the rural area who are people that live on the old homestead. They live by themselves in big farmhouses. They don't have family or their family are away. So it's important for their help to socialize and to get them out there. So I kind of feel like I'm in a place where if I go out there to bring more people in, I might not have the bus service to bring them in, in the areas they go to. They also are sometimes called, do you know anyone that could take me to a doctor's appointment? Do you know anyone that could take me to get some groceries? You know. So a lot of that is a big setback over in our area. But I think that the people that I have talked into coming, and we're in the process, we need to expand our area. We have been renting for five years on a property that has four apartments plus the space that we rent. And it's come to the point that we need more space for our exercise rooms, for our dining area. And we do a lot of different classes like meditation and, and um, Tai Chi and also Brenda's from the center. Tai Chi, we offer art classes for a fee. We don't charge dues. And we haven't. I, don't think they ever did at the center before I went there, but I've told my board of directors I can't do that because we have people, the older people, we're working to get them out of their home to socialize, get exercise. They cannot on their social security pay an annual due and pay also to go to these classes. So we don't do it. That's why we do a lot of fundraising. It's part of it to make up that difference, but we're there to serve them, and they're my main concern. So, I don't think I have anything else. I think all senior centers have been through the same thing. Oh, he's smiling, so I didn't make an enemy. No, you raised very good points. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, do you have any questions? 
The expansion, I'm just beginning to work on it, Brenda, and oh my God, the government paperwork to get constructed is something else, and it's all new to me. But we are designing our expansion, and we're hoping within a couple of months, you know, to have it all together, and then we're going to go to RD World Development and see if we can get some loans to help us, and then I would very much in the spring like to start the expansion. You have a committee, right? Uh, yes, we do. There's two, three of us working on it, so. Yeah, and you're one of our people that come, and I know you know how much we need the room. Yeah. Our exercise space is just blown, yeah. and so, yeah. So hopefully there's government saves a little money for us. You got that? <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you very much. Whoops. Do you get any, do you get any money from the communities that you serve? We do. Um, we have a policy. We don't charge. We asked if they could make a donation for $5 a meal. I have three drivers that go out in any weather. And if they cannot make a donation for the meals, it's all very confidential. And we still we still deliver meals because they need it. And there are people that can't afford to donate. So we're there to serve them, to help. Yes. The towns we do uh, ask each year on town meeting and uh, the most that we get from towns, uh, not all of them, we cover the six towns, we ask for $3,000, and then we have one town we ask 1000 because they're very small. But, uh, and there again, and through Central Vermont Council on Aging, we contract with them for each meal that we do, age 60 and over, we get reimbursed $3.65. And it takes us, it, it, the cost of putting a meal together with the, with the supplies you need, you know, the packaging and all that, and we do re reimburse some of the drivers like 58 cents a mile. Uh, some of them donate it, but uh, $3.65 when it costs you between eight and $9 to prepare one meal is not a lot. So I'm happy to take up on that. Uh, as, as you know, I've been doing this forever. Started in 1981 with the Visiting Nurses Association, then began working for the Area Agency on Aging in Champlain Valley, ran the senior centers in Burlington. Uh, while I was uh, executive director of Champlain Senior Center, we went to work trying to consolidate the senior centers that were in the Burlington area, which is where I met Gail and took a detour to run a theater company for 13 years and now I'm back working with Cathedral Square Corporation on housing, which is its own mm -hmm. crazy talk that we all need to have sometime about where all of these wonderful people are going to be living, um, not in a box in the Intervale, but that will, we could talk about that another time. What I do wanna say is it's, it's a little, uh, I'm gonna say a little disheartening. I'm gonna say a little disheartening. I'm trying to put a glow on it, but it's a little disheartening to be talking so much about things that we talked about almost 40 years ago. And part of that is because of Vermont is very unique. We have always embraced our uniqueness, but in some areas, our uniqueness has been a challenge for us. I think back in the 80s when, we, when I first started doing this work, the state felt that every single community had its uh, right and authority and moral obligation to make sure that the seniors in their individual community were being served the way that individual community should provide for them. It's great that Vermont always has the um, feeling that the people within the community should make help make decisions with everyone in the community about what to do. But what that inevitably did as time goes on is make all these little patches of senior centers and, and programs all over the state 
that do things in different ways and smaller ways and it costs a fortune. And the state of Vermont has always been sort of loath to bring all of the senior centers together and try to make a plan for what it can look like uh, from a, a, a legislative look when people are, but within our community, we're taking care of everybody. But the, again, there's 600,000 of us. We cannot pay the taxes that it takes for 600,000 of us to have roads and schools and firehouses and big, that help all the seniors. We do need to have some sort of top-down management. So over the 40 years, there's this, been this sort of struggle between the legislators saying, they're doing fine, and us can-do Vermonters going, yeah, we're doing fine, you, it's okay. Uh, but really, we're not doing fine. <laughs> we're just, we're brave and strong, and we're making sure that we get people out of their farmhouses and into the senior centers at enormous cost. And it's also what happens in Burlington compared to what happens in the middle of the state is like what happens in Canada versus what happens in Indonesia. It's two different situations. In Burlington, we have everything is much closer. Getting people to the services in Burlington is still incredibly expensive and challenging, but not nearly the challenge that we have in rural areas to get, to get people out. So there has been this huge gap of uh, sort of, uh, help and management and fundraising on an overall looking at Vermont from a, a full state uh, situation that still kind of exists. We, we, uh, when I was uh, about the 80, in the 80s, the state of Wyoming, which I will never compare us to Wyoming except in this one way, <laughs> um, has a very similar population and a very large area and they finally voted to have statewide funding from the taxpayers for the senior centers in Wyoming. It made an enormous difference in the state of Wyoming for delivery service. So they have very similar challenges. So that's what I still see. I'm gonna, Gail is still working on that struggle now, so I'm gonna let her okay. talk a second. And, I'll and then you can come back and talk and ask me a question, but. I'll take the mic, just, okay. I want everyone I, I, uh, I'm Gail Morrow. I was the director of the Heineberg Senior Center for 18 years. Uh, Cindy Zook hired me, and we, uh, I learned and worked with Cindy for 10 years, and it was, it was great. Um, so I was at the Heineberg for 18 years, and I fundraised my little brains out, and worked and worked and worked, created a vibrant center. However, it takes a toll because I was the only staff person at that center. I left there and I knew that there had to be a different way to keep senior centers vital and active and inclusive. So I applied for a grant from Dale, which is the uh, Department of Aging and Independent Living, and they granted me some money to see if I could establish some sort of communication between senior center directors all across the state of Vermont. Because what happens is, I worked my little brains out, but I was all alone. I was all alone in my center, working many hours, and never having the time to look at best practices, to engage myself with other senior center directors. So we're all these little pockets of centers all around the state, and we're all doing great things, and we're all alone. Right. There's, there's Which is really. in the state's best interest, but oh, not in our community's right. best interest. The one thing that I, I quote Cindy a lot in my lifetime, but this is one thing that I have quoted the, probably the most. The great thing about the state of Vermont is we're independent. And the bad thing about the state of Vermont is we're independent. And I thought I could do it all because, you know, I'm one of those Vermonters. But in the end, it, is it the best scenario? No, it is not. So myself, with this grant from Dale, and along with really good directors from around the state of Vermont, formed an organization called VASCAMP, which stands for Vermont Association of Senior Centers and Meal Providers. And I worked that issue for about three years. We, um, we came together, we had conferences, and then at some point, 
you know, the grant ran out like long ago and I'm still working my little tail off. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I really do want to retire at some point. I got four grandchildren that live right around me and I really do want to spend more time with, with, with them. So I tried to retire. And you know how that well works. <laughs> um, but Vast Camp has gone on very well without me. We had support also from AARP, I did want to mention that. But two, uh, two or three or four people have kept it going on and they are now doing what VASCAMP needs to do. They are advocating, they're going to the state legislature. They're talking about the need for a sustainable way to fund senior centers. Because this is the one statistic that really got me this past year, and I keep saying it, and I'm sorry if you've heard it a million times, but it's one that we do need to hear. The negative health impacts of loneliness is the same as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. You take that in and you think about that for a minute. That's what we are doing if we do not provide opportunities for people of all ages, but you know, I'm concerned only about older adults because you know, there I am, here I am now. Um, so I'm gonna be selfish in saying that's what I'm concerned about. Senior centers provide an opportunity for people to take a good class, to take an exercise program. And I do wanna say, I've been carrying around this, this document here. It is called Vermont Senior Center Supporting Socialization health and well-being for older Vermonters. It was a survey that I started when I first went and started Fast Camp, and which Dale has now taken on, and they do have an updated version. So if you wanna log on to Dale and re really read about the survey, because what it does is it tells you the advantages of centers, what they're doing, how many programs they're running, but it also talks about what are the challenges of keeping senior centers afloat in the state of Vermont? And it is really good. There's also a really good foreword by Angela smith Jang, who is the director of older adults as part of Dale. So I'd recommend if anybody wants more information about senior centers to log on to Dale and read this survey. So I will pass that on to you. All right, thank you. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, all right, so the goal is State. The vast camp. The, uh, the, I think. Are you asking if there is a goal to create this organization across the country? No, in Vermont. No. In Vermont, yeah, it is across the state of Vermont now. Vast camp yeah. is uh, a part of uh, anyone. Any senior center in the state of Vermont can join in with the efforts of Vast Camp. But are, Yeah, uh, you know what? I don't know. Yeah, like I said, I tried to retire a few years ago. <laughs> no, I don't know. I did go to their conference this fall, and I believe there were about 20 senior center directors there. But, you know, that does not really tell you the true picture, because you know how hard it is, Rita, to get a day off to, to go to a conference? To get a day off to yeah. go. I was yeah. just that's, that's part of the problem. Yeah. yeah. So but any senior center is eligible to join Bass Camp. And I would highly encourage senior centers to just join so that you are part of you the group come. that says we're together. Right. We're a network. But then if, you're, you if your senior center powerful. joins the VAST camp, though, the volunteers have to get together and say, we need to give Rita a day off so she can go to the conference and learn more. It's not enough to join. That's you have right. to get a group of people. Yeah, right. Right. And they're also, <laughs> you know, they are, there's two women who are advocating in the legislature. They need to know the issues that are pertinent, important to your senior center. Yeah, yeah. And people like Rita, may, you know, maybe she doesn't feel like she's in a silo, but many do. And oh, yeah. this, is, this is so valuable for other directors to get together. Yes. And I just want to say, why can't some of us who are board members, I know Montpelier is very active in this. Yes, they are. And, and uh, I spend a lot of time at the legislature on health care issues. I'd love to go up there and be, be part of this as just one of the advisory council members. And, and Jana Claire is one of the women that have taken Vast right. Camp and moved on. So yes, talk, yes, so. absolutely. Yes. I, I'd just like to say that Jana would be here, but she has childcare problems. 
Because she's a single mom. That's the other end of things. We're not yeah. talking about that today. No, we don't care about the kids. We don't care about the kids. <laughs> That's somebody else's problem today. How Washington. We're gonna. But, no, but, but it's very true. I, she's very involved, she in, um, and she and she does have children. But um, but that has not stopped her from being no, very involved no. in the issues that affect. Uh, older adults and senior centers across the state of Vermont. But the real point I was going to make is, I think that, I'm not sure we're the only one, but we're certainly one of the few states that does not provide any funding directly for senior centers. And you would be very and correct. You would be correct. correct. And you would be correct. Yeah, there, are three, there are three states that provide no funding for senior centers. No, Louis say. Louisiana, Mississippi and Vermont. And Vermont. Yeah. And how the hell did we get into those two states? And that's why we need to be organized and to use our power and visit our legislators. Speaking of a legislator. Speaking of a legislator. Um, so I'm Dan Noyce. I represent the towns of Wolcott, High Park, Johnson, and Belvedere. So does everyone know who their legislator is? Does everyone know? Because yeah. it's really important that you reach out to them and talk to them about that issue. The fact that we're only one of three states that don't support senior yeah. centers. So um, one thing that you can when you reach out to them is to talk about the Older Vermonters Caucus. So um, when I first was elected, um, we know that um, Older Vermonters is the population that is the largest it's you know we're gonna be the oldest state um, we're also it's the largest population in Vermont and hey, so vote. pardon me hey, we vote. and you vote sure <laughs> but that's um, and so one of the things that I did was um, I said well we have all of these caucuses and what they are is a place for legislators to come together on a weekly basis to affect talk about the issues whatever their caucus is there's a climate caucus there's a rural Vermont caucus there's a workers caucus, there's all these different ones. And I said, well, why isn't there an older Vermonters caucus? So I stood up and I said, the older Vermonters caucus is gonna meet tomorrow morning at eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and- uh, That's the problem, eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so you raise a good point. It was a problem. And I struggled through finding a room. There was no rooms available in that state house at noon. So before I left at the end of the last session, I reserved the um, uh, Ethan Allen room for noon on every Thursday for the whole session to hold it at noon. And that way we'll have more people coming there because that was one of the feedbacks that I got from my, um, my colleagues in the legislature was that I can't be there at eight o'clock in the morning or I've got other stuff going on at eight o'clock in the morning. So now it's gonna be at noon. So we'll see if that changes it. And um, so basically, I'll just run through some of the topics and, um, and then I wanna um, touch on some of the things that were brought up here. But like, we're starting out with uh, Dr. Uh, Lamontia from UVM Medical, uh, UVM Center on Aging, and he is gonna kinda talk about like big picture stuff, just like we heard about the impact um, of not having companionship. Um, he's going to talk about, uh, you know, access to transportation and how that affects um, people who want to age in place. Um, and then Commissioner Monica Hutt is going to talk about the priorities of Dale. That'll be our second one. Um, and then the Older Vermonters Act. And I'll, I'll talk about that because it's some legislation that Teresa Wood and I are introducing <coughs> that's gonna be taken up in the Human Service Committee in the second week. I just got a text from uh, Representative Pugh, who's the chair. She's like, will the bill be ready? Because I wanna take it up in the second week. So that made my day. Um, and then we're gonna get into the budget um, because the um, Dale budget is gonna, is presented right about the second week, we'll hear from the governor on what their, his priorities are for the budget. And so we'll have an overview for the representatives on what does the Dale budget look like. And, you know, that's a perfect point to bring up during that, um, you know, during our discussions. And once that budget comes out, to really point out that this is one of three states that does not support funding to senior centers. Um, then we have wellness prevention. Um, mental health and substance abuse, um, 
and then town meeting break. Um, and then after town meeting break is senior centers. And that's because I want you all to invite your legislators during town meeting break to come to your senior center. And then while they're there say, don't forget when you go back that following Thursday, the Older Vermonters Caucus is gonna be talking about senior centers. And you should go and let's listen to you know, how we're gonna to work together to come up with funding and for senior centers. So it's right after town meeting break that was put there for a reason. Um, then we have adult protective services, workforce, and not only workforce engaging older Vermonters in the workforce, but how are we going to have a workforce that is at um, nursing homes, PCAs, personal care attendants. Um, so we're gonna talk about both sides of that. Um, and then social isolation, nutrition meals on wheels, um, transportation and housing um, are kind of the round out of the topics in our, um, that we'll be talking about. Now, Rita talked about the fact that um, the access or the funding for transportation, if you should talk to your legislator about making sure there's money there, it's under E&D, Elderly and Disabled Transportation really point out that's what this is called in the budget it's the e and d money you want that increased um and so one of the things that we also are going to be talking about is a um cap and trade for transportation fuels so we have um for electricity in vermont we have um a um efficiency vermont and that's we all pay money on our um electrical bill to help with weatherization of our homes there's going to be a push, um, it's a nine state, nine New England states, well, there's not nine New England states, but the there Northeast sh there New should England, be. There should be, right. <laughs> We're gonna take Delaware and Connecticut. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so that's the nine states are all gonna get together and try to have a cap and trade for um, transportation fuels, and we'll be voting on that. And this is a perfect opportunity to say that a portion of that funding should be mandated to um, the E&D program so that it's to um, basically reimburse transportation providers rates so that they can um, have fuel efficient vehicles. And um, you know, if that money's gonna be used for transportation, this is a way to um, reduce our, imp our climate impact, our carbon usage in Vermont. Transportation is our highest one. And so, you know, that would be something that I would bring up with my leg, you know, so anyone can come call me up and talk to me, but I'm already thinking about this stuff. So. <laughs> but, you know, you should definitely yeah. bring that up as this is gonna be some funding that's gonna be coming into the state um, should this bill pass and you know maybe some of it should be directed towards the E&D program to provide that transportation. Um, the reimbursement rate for the meals, you said it was three dollars and 65, 65 cents. cents. That's pretty crazy. So um, yeah. um, McDonald's charges more than that. I know, you cannot do it for that. We're gonna be supplementing with raccoons. So there is some legislation that says that um, that I would love to see taken up that basically says um, under Medicaid that um, food is yes. health. And if right. we can use healthcare dollars to give more than $3, it's a, a bill that's in the Human Services Committee. It's um, looking at the Medicaid waiver, or so that's how the state partners with the federal government to get funding dollars. It's to say that we should be using Medicaid dollars to fund Meals on Meal, Wheels programs. Meals on wheels. And I agree so with that you. is sitting on the wall um, in the Human Services Committee. Uh, Representative wow. Wood and I put that bill in. Um, I don't know the number, but I can look it up when we're done and uh, pull it up on my phone pretty quick. Okay. If you pull up my profile under um, the Vermont legislature, you scroll down the bottom, it shows all the bills I've introduced. Right. Right. It's in there. And that's an easy way to figure out where to find stuff, um, you know, is on, the, on that, um, their website. So one of the things that um, I'll just um, talk about is the Older Vermonters Act. So this is the bill that I, I talked about before. And this, I think, once this is passed, this is really going to help us um, kind of create the path towards um, 
funding for senior centers. Um, basically what it does is it's like the Older Americans Act, which is the federal legislation that provides money for, that's where that three dollars comes from. Right. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, this is kind of the framework for saying what older Vermonters should expect when they're aging in Vermont. And if we can pass this Older, Ameri uh, older Vermonters Act, then we can reference that when we say, you know, why are seniors, why are we one of three states that's not funding senior centers? Why are our nutrition programs not being adequately funded? And why aren't our, um, uh, you know, transportation, why isn't that adequately funded? So um, this is a bill that will be taken up the second week of the session. Um, we don't have a copy of it yet. Teresa Wood and I met with the lawyers, the ledge council up at the state house, and we went through, um, well, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. Where the, the, where the language for this bill came from was three years ago, uh, we put in a bill to create the Older Vermonters Working Group. And what it did was brought together people from all of the different agencies that provide service, services to Older Vermonters. So there was people from Vascant, there was people from Meals on Wheels, there was the Council on Aging's Home Health, um, SASH, um, there was all kinds of, um, you know, there's probably 30 people on this committee. And over the course of the year, we worked to create the, um, the older, Vermont, this report that said, okay, what, what should this legislation look like? How do we um, work together? How do these agencies work together to provide these, provide these services? How do we, um, um, you know, how do we know people are better off? What are we measuring? How do we, you know, so we took that report, which um, is not actually out yet. Uh, it's not on the website because the department has the final say on what's in it, but I have the draft. So I took the draft report, which I feel is, uh, represents a lot of the really good work we did. Um, and that's what Teresa Wood and I brought to Ledge Council to draft this legislation. Um, obviously we want the department uh, of Dale to be part of it. We also want all of you and um, you know all of the agencies that provide services to older Vermonters to be part of saying, yeah, we need this. What we don't want is someone saying, no, this is not good. Um, and if we, the more people that um, reach out to their representatives and say this is an important piece of legislation that we want to see move forward, that will create the framework so that, how long have we been talking about this? Was it? You said oh, yeah, oh, 40, yes. 40, years. 40 years. 40 years. Yeah, we don't want to talk years. about it anymore. Yeah. Been, <laughs> since 1982, we've been yeah, talking we about it. Really. We're, we don't want to talk about it anymore. So, um, you know, I often feel that way sometimes while we're debating on the floor. It's like, I'm tired of yeah. talking. Let's just yeah. vote. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so anyways, um, I'd be, if anyone has any questions about some of this, and um, I just have a one sheet. It's my draft copy. I'm still... Some of the dates may change as I try to line up presenters. So I ran through um, kind of the topics of the Older Vermonters Caucus um, for this session, but that might not be the order it works out because I have specific people that I would like to present to legislators. And if they're not available on these dates, I might move some dates around. So anyway. I just want to, uh, mm -hmm. you go. But, no, is there a way uh, or can we connect with you or, or so that we can log on and find out the, yeah. uh, the final date? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. Uh, pardon me? May I give you my email? Um, you can. Um, I will find a place where I can post it. Um, I'll send it out to all the senior centers and maybe they can post it on the wall there so that if people want to participate, I know that Ruby um, from Cove and I have been working on this, so she's going to help me get the word out as well. Um, you know, once, I, once we get into the legislature, once January 7th, I. I'm trying to do my two jobs. I, yeah. As you know, I run RSVP. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes things get lost. Yeah. <laughs> um, I say give your info. People can log on. Yeah. Um, I'll find a place to put the, yeah. um, the, the final schedule. But you'll know every Thursday at noon there will be a topic um, that we talk about at the legislature. And you can make sure that that gets out to all of us who came to the conference? Yeah, I can. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I'll make sure. Yeah, that's wonderful. What I wanted to say real quick while we're t talking about this uh, is I think it's a time now to think about the systems structure of how this stuff is occurring. We've we've been doing this service here, here. It's like a Rube Goldberg machine. We've been yeah. doing it here, 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 here. 
But now the baby boomer population is enormous. The funding is being cut. And one of the ways that we always receive senior center funding was through the five area agencies on aging. Yes. And it is a it, it is a burden to them to keep having to decide how much of their precious funding they can squirt through to the senior centers. I, that's why I really want to see direct senior center funding from the legislator and not burden, because the area agencies on aging are doing a, a Herculean job, uh, doing so many services. And every year we would talk to uh, the heads of our uh, Champlain Valley agencies and they'd say, how much can you give us? Well, gosh, Cindy, I don't know. We've got to do this, we've got to do this, we've got to do this, and we'll give the senior center as much as we can. I would love to see that taken off the plates and the burdens of the area agencies on aging who have so much to do and just figure out a way to fund us Directly. Directly. And yeah. then the other people, yay, hooray! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and not, they won't mind. They will not think it's yeah. a problem. They won't mind. And then the other thing that I would really love to see um, while I'm here is the state and even the feds and even us guys. We need to find a way to help nonprofit organizations advertise for people to do this work. Because part of the problem that we're really having in Vermont right now is even if we got money, we don't have people to drive the buses. They cannot keep bus drivers. They cannot keep home health workers. They cannot keep home homemakers and housekeepers. They do cannot fill these positions. We have waiting lists of people who need these services. Medicaid will give them money to do these services, but there's no human bodies to do these services. And I really think that that is a role that the state could play more. I see all these commercials on TV going, hey, be an engineer, be a study mm. math and do this. And I want to see those commercials that say, come into human services. There are great jobs in human services, transportation, homemaking services. There are no, there's Medicaid money. I've got Medicaid money to pay people right now to help people do stuff. Big pay, great benefits nobody to do the jobs. And that, I think, is a huge impact on us aging here in the state of Vermont. I'm getting very excited Great. because I it's know. so complicated. <laughs> it's so complicated. Yeah. I also think that the time has passed where we can promise people that who live in a house 25 miles up a hill that we can send a bus to get them every day of the week. It's just too expensive. We need to figure out as a community, how to embrace people to come to to reach out for help and get other people to help because it's sust financially sustainable in Vermont. We can't send a bus up every 25 mile hill. It's really complicated. Then pay private drivers. Yeah, I don't. So, yeah, we have to figure it out. That's around housing. Yeah, that's around housing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of our big topics we want to address is, is transportation. Green Mountain Transit has come out with a plan that's going to have all these buses going without any drivers, and they're going to be all, you know, have a, a wonderful system, but they haven't come to anything. Is Green Mountain Transit working with you guys at all? Because their money is all to help people get to work and back, you know, transportation to jobs to try to get cars off the road which is a great, wonderful thing for the climate, for the environment. Right. But they don't seem to have much interest in putting any money into elders' transportation. Well, the pie is small. The pie is very small. So yes, we need more money for, for transportation. But then but still the- part of your group, the Green Mountain Transit, some of the other- so the, the, Yeah, they are, in, the, they are in Chittenden County, they are. Where the, tra the transportation providers were at the table yeah. when we were, had the Older Vermonters Working Group that um, helped draft the kind of the report that we used to, for the legislation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, as you know, it's extremely difficult to do point-to-point -point transportation. It's, uh, again, that's another thing that we try to work on. I, one of my jobs is to work with the primary care physicians so that if someone's getting an appointment, maybe I can get three people to go at the same time and the doctors can, can organize it. Because you know it's very difficult to say, well, I have to pick up this person at 1 o'clock and take them to this health center, and then this person at 3 o'clock to take them to this health center. And that is just astoundingly expensive. 
So how can we figure that piece out? Yeah. I have my own car. Yeah. When I have to do an eye appointment in Burlington, one driver took two of us down, and then another driver came to pick me up. People I'd never seen. Yeah. It used to be with Green Mountain Transit, somebody would come and accompany you. Yeah. They can't do it. No. There's no money, no time, and they can't find drivers. No what I've tried to. to <laughs> There's a question over here. <laughs> what I tried to do in the. There's a question. You, you in question. In terms of data collection on oh. needs, like needs for transportation, energy needs, things like that, is there a way to involve the local select boards? I think people get more involved if they thought, thought it was coming out of their local community. Like I have some harebrained scheme that like, you know, if we could survey how many seniors heat with wood, you know, there's been so many trees felled by these storms we've had. There's a lot of wood out there that could be harvested. You could recruit the local Boy Scout troops and some local loggers to cut up wood, deliver it to old, older, you know, with cordwood going for $300 a cord. That's a major expense for elderly people when they're still heating with wood. I mean, there's, I think there's ways we can involve the select boards in collecting data on who needs transportation, who has this need or that need. So the, the question was, is how do we collect data? Um, how do we involve local communities in finding out what the, the needs are and what, if we can involve select boards? And I would say that the senior centers are probably a good resource for, you know, doing some sort of data collection. I know that, um, Dale reaches out, um, you know, and tries to, to figure out what the current needs are through the Council on Aging's and Home Health and the senior centers. But, and then your point, um, you also talked about um, heating, uh, home heating with, with wood. Um, in Lamoille County, we started the wood bank and we have volunteers that cut and deliver firewood. Um, and we, we do about 100 cord a year in Lamoille. And, uh, if somebody wants to start one of those programs in their own community, I would be able to tell you how to do that. <laughs> what I also did, Dan, I um, advertised and tried to recruit what I call periodic uh, volunteers that will go and help stack wood, that will take people to doctor's appointments and that, because I do get calls for this service. and. I always referred them to the bus company. It didn't work, and they seem to be more comfortable, I think, with people in their own communities. Mm -hmm. And I had a good response, and I keep a list. Yeah. Did you advertise? I put it through uh, Front Porch Forum several times, and in our newsletter. Right, and I'm finding that very difficult to recruit them. The younger generation no. is busy. I've tried. <laughs> I've tried. And I do think transportation will need to fall more and more on the state because of liability, too. Yeah. I've lost a lot of transportation volunteers because they don't want people in their cars. They'll say, Cindy, I'll do anything for you, but don't ask me to drive somebody because they're just terrified that if something, if they had a fender bender or the person got sick and had a heart attack in their car, they just don't want to do that. No. They'll do anything else. They'll say, I'll do anything else, mm -hmm. but please don't ask me to put someone in my car. And that's happening more and more. So transportation is falling and should fall more and more as a, a county, city, and state problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, have you also tapped on um, home share? Home, home, home share. share. So the question was, is have we reached out to home share? Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. um, really I know the home share yeah. in. They're always a big player. Yeah, they, yeah. they, they um, they've merged now, right? Yes. With yes. the home share for, yep. Washington, for Washington County merged with Chittenden County? Yes. Yep. Maybe way a way for more people. Like I, I am, I'm getting a home share person, but I have an apartment in my house. If I didn't, and I wanted to do it, and get some help arranging space or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some people might have that space, but they don't know how to arrange it for somebody to right. live there. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I would. 
think home share would help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think I they have experts. Yeah. I'm all set, but I'm thinking of other people. Right. Yeah. Might That's probably something that they work on, yeah. trying to figure out how to make it work within the structure of their home. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I have had them at the center to Here's doing a, a presentation. You were talking about um, individuals not wanting to take people in their vehicles. Yes. And in the past, I've had drivers having to take me to cold tests with the doctor. Yes. My question would be, uh, is there some way you could look into getting a special insurance mm -hmm. for these people who drive that if they did have vendor if something would happen they wouldn't have to depend upon their own insurance company has that anybody mm -hmm. thought about looking at doesn't that? rsvp have that we have we rsvp has supplemental insurance for the individual but not for the car okay. so if you got hurt um there is an, a small insurance program mm -hmm. through rsvp but I think that's an interesting thought. I think yeah. that's a very uh, worthy solution to begin looking yeah. at. Yeah, yeah, I tried to run a volunteer mm -hmm. ride program in mm -hmm. Lamoille County, and I spent all my time raising money for the insurance company. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's what ended it, because I yeah. couldn't afford to come up with the money to, to pay the insurance on this van that I had. Yeah. Put it on your state and list. I think United Way of Chippewa County state has a program universe. too, and I don't know what they did. Yeah, uh, yeah. and it's the scheduling was really hard for yeah. just one person. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a good plot mm -hmm. for the future. Yeah. I know background checks have been an issue because yeah. we yeah. all yeah. Uh, yeah. run right. five background checks on our volunteers. So there right. is um, there is a bill in judiciary committee to combine that all into one and it allows nonprofits to share mm -hmm. as long as the volunteer says yes you can share my background and inform check information with meals on wheels you know if you were um, a transportation if you were doing both um, or if you were signing up to do both it, it uh, has uh, the ability for the agencies to share because department of human services requires back background checks on volunteers if you receive money from them. Any other questions? We'll wrap it up. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, behind you. Oh, behind, you. behind you. Behind you, Jane. Hi, Hi. I'm, I'm Bob Atchison. I'm the energy coordinator in Plainfield. And we're working with uh, Vermont Council on Rural Development in a process called RAMP, revitalizing all of Marshall and Plainfield. But I just wanted to let you know on the subject of wood heating that there is a biomass uh, incentive program through Efficiency Vermont. Uh, it uh, will cover wood, chunk wood stoves, pellet stoves, and also a conversion from maybe you've got an old monitor kerosene heater and want to change to wood. We found out from uh, Energy Action Network's data that 40% of Marshfield and Plainfield heat with wood. Ooh. Which is kind of a surprising wow. number to us. Yeah. And uh, but anyway, you can get your old clunker of a wood stove <laughs> from the seventies or eighties, which is now considered old, swapped out. Mm -hmm. And if you're at a certain low income level, you can get a change for free. So take advantage of that. Uh, as an addition in Marshall Plainfield, we've also negotiated with stove works and flagging stove works and the hearth, hearth place on Barry Montpelier Road, where they will give you a discounted insult, even if you're not at the lower income level. So take advantage. Nice. Good information. And I believe Good your news. senator in Washington Good County runs that. A third yeah. to a half of what you just did you would be for. Yeah, you, uh, mm -hmm. and Senator Perch, Perchlick, yeah. I think he runs Perchlick. that program. Yeah. Oh. Yes. You try to say something else? No. Okay. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> and I just wanted to say, Dan, I did attend um, toward the end of the session last last session. Yep. Um, your AAM meetings. Yep. <laughs> wow. I kind of got there. Um, and it was very interesting. I heard a lot about different programs throughout the state by the people who ran them, and which I really didn't know about and I thought I was fairly knowledgeable but obviously not 
So that is a great service that you've been doing, and you do that on your own. This is not mm -hmm. something that's part of your legislative duties, nope. officially, that is. <laughs> Just do it. So <laughs> Just do it. Just do it. Good. Those seniors got to do it. Yeah, good man. And, and I also want to say thank you to all three of you particular people. You're simply one more um, Link. symbol of the incredible dedication and, and work that our senior center people do all over the, all over the state. It is a labor of love, that's very clear. <laughs> but it would be nice if you had some more help and more, more help. Yay. So my, my, my challenge to you, that's all of you, is what can we do I'm talking about fueling senior power, okay? Um, what can you do to get something done in this, either this coming legislative season or around your local community or wherever it is? But we have power, and we need to learn how to use it. So that is what the purpose, really. Whether it's in Washington or locally, we can do it. But we got to feel comfortable with it. you got to know what you're talking about. That's why these folks have all been here. And um, we can get things done. And, and I can tell you, handwritten notes to a legislator go a long way. Those, like, email things, I get hundreds of email things. Don't even bother. Just take a piece of paper and write, you know, whatever that you're concerned about on a piece of paper and mail it, mail it to them. That makes a big impact. Mary Ellen? How about writing a letter to the editor or getting a comment? Letter to the editor. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, handwritten notes are really effective. Um, and even, um, you know, you can mail them to the sergeant at arms office at the state house and they'll have a page, bring it to, the, to, the to your legislator. Um, you know, just sending like a, a form email letter. It's not even worth clicking on the mouse because I get so many of them. You can't yeah. even read them all. And the scans are so <laughs> horrendous. Did you hear all that? No. no. The Free Press in Burlington, the Times Argus in the Montpelier and Rutland, for that matter, Harold. Um, um, there's, you know, seven days. Vermont Digger. Vermont Digger. All those places. Yes. And Newport. Wherever you are. The bridge. The bridge. Yeah. Montpelier Bridge. Absolutely. So these, these are hometown mm -hmm. folks. Right, right the bridge. Right the bridge. And they will print you. I think we really need to talk to the people who attend the senior centers. I'm sorry, you need to talk to what? Talk to people. Yeah, let me know. I'll come to your stuff. Yeah. I'll come to your shed. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Did you hear Janet? We're going to get uh, his She's saying talk to the people in your local senior center and get them aware of all of what we've been talking about here. So, but, my but you know, Vermont is, for a, is a really right. a unique <laughs> situation know where we have personal contacts with our reps and mm -hmm. with, with the people who make the decisions. And so, hey, use them. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> no, it's good. I, yeah. I, I want people to reach out, you know? Mm -hmm. I think it's a good thing. Okay. I might not agree with you all the time, but, you know, that's okay. <laughs> it would be weird if you did. Oh. <laughs> it would be boring, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what this process is all about. Yeah. But, at any rate, right now the process is lunch. lunch.
Thank you guys for listening to us babble up there.